Nine days in, our adventure in Madagascar changes pace. Following a return flight from Diego to Tana, a minibus transports our gang of four, plus Nancy and Frederic, a Belgian couple, to Miandrivazo, on the western flank of the Bungalava Plateau. The arid mountaintops appear largely devoid of life. I see the isolated roadside homes and wonder, how do they do it? How do folks here survive? From atop the westernmost hills of Madagascar's central highlands, the Manabi Plain stretches out before us. Below, at the confluence of two tributaries, the Tsurambenya River begins its slow winding path to the Mozambique Channel. We embark a 40-foot craft somewhat reminiscent of the African queen. Her crew consists mainly of young men. Everyone here looks young. Indeed, half of Madagascar's population is 26 years old and younger, about 8 million people, and half of them are young children. For the next several days, the deafening clang and bang from the diesel engine will be our soundtrack, a signal from miles around. Make way, the African queen! The Tsirambinia is wide and shallow. Even with our light load, compared to the 50 to 75 people normally filling a taxi bruce, the flat-bottom boat only has a couple inches of draft. Our boatman, ever alert, watches very carefully steering the long craft along the deepest and most swift sections of the river. Even so, we often run aground. It's a welcome break from the engine noise, a chance to cool in the river. <laughs> Helping prepare our lunch is Umberi, our guide from here out. Malagasy cuisine is simple and delicious. Today's menu, zebu, a humped cattle believed to be the world's oldest domesticated cow from India. Some zebu is tender, not this, the difference being the zebu's diet. So here's why the charred ground around every corner, an attempt to spur new growth of grass Soft green grasses equals tender steak. We're in Sakalava territory, comprising much of the western region of Madagascar. Sakalava, meaning people of the Long Valley, are semi-nomadic pastoralists, herding great numbers of zebu, fishing, and planting rice along river valleys. The Tsirambinia River leads us to ever more remote hinterland. But people are never far. Our pace is often so slow, a person walking easily catches up and hitches a ride. A handful of boats like our African Queen represent these people's only connection to the outside. We're a source of transportation. 
a source of entertainment. And, as we're about to learn, we're often their lifeline. She wants us to give her a ride. A woman steps forward, obviously distraught. Her child is very ill. Yeah, they can't get to the doctor. No way to get treatment. We're asked to transport mother and child to the nearest doctor. The child's condition appears serious. A very hungry mother says it's her husband's fault. He cursed her, making her child sick to hurt her. Pam believes the child suffers pneumonia. It doesn't cry or make a sound. It's breathing labored. Nancy observes the clenched fist and fixed jaw, believes it might be lockjaw from tetanus. Fact is, none of us are doctors. We don't know. And next to providing transport, we're of little help. Western medicine is many miles beyond reach. If the mother would even have it, she seeks the work of a shaman in a nearby village. That village is upstream, back the way we came. Our plans were to visit a gorge with waterfalls further downstream, a promising location to finally meet up with Nile Crocodile. Of course, we all agree on doing what we can for the child. But Frederic and Nancy have worked hard to make their journey here possible. Asked if she'd still choose to pay for a tour of the Cherubinia, knowing the trip would be cut short responding to a medical emergency, Nancy replies, No, this is our vacation. Of course we don't pay to see suffering. Umberi says this often happens people with no way out turning to him for help. Ecotourism. It's Umberi's livelihood, and it's the lifeblood for Madagascar. But if he's unable to shield clients from his country's hardships and lack of infrastructure, that makes Umberi's job tough. Tourists looking for fun in the sun can find plenty of that kind of thing here. It's not why we've come. We stop to buy dinner. Fresh tilapia from the Tsirnbenia. The first world meets the fourth world. We're happy simply to look at them. They seem equally happy to look back at us. We point our mysterious gadgets their way. They don't seem to mind. We buy their fish. Treat them to a bag of dried fruit. <laughs> Everybody happy? At last, a chance to get out and move. Up ahead lies the Bemaraha Plateau. Our climb to the top, roughly a thousand feet gain in elevation, begins through rocky terrain. 
Is this area charred because some local is that desperate to attempt spurring grass growth here? Fires here often get out of hand. The stifling noonday heat slows progress. We each hike alone, left to our thoughts. I'm thinking of the woman and her sick baby. Will she make it? We had let them out at a village to visit the shaman. Our climb isn't just for the exercise and for the view. And Barry wants to show us a place he found adventuring alone. I'm interested to see the Tsurambinia and the surrounding land from some height. Yet another fire in the largely treeless river valley. Over there, beyond the rocky slope we've climbed, the only heavily wooded area we've seen, according to Mberi, full of lemurs and absolutely off limits. I wonder how such protective measures are enforced way out here. So, here's Mberi's find. A fossil bed, brachiopods everywhere. Filter feeder shells attached to the seafloor a long time ago. Look at this. It's full. This one. Somebody chose this place, high above the Manabi Plain, to place a tomb for a loved one. The following morning, passing through a village, we inexplicably encounter the troubled woman, mourning the loss of her baby just hours before. Getting around in Madagascar is rarely a straightforward thing. Two near-lying points on a map might be days apart. Case in point, to get from our takeout on the Tsirnbenia River near Miandravazo to our put-in on the Manambolo River at Ankavandra, uh, not including the mile or so hike from the village to the actual put-in point. We first had to drive back to Tana and nearly backtrack to Ankavandra, click off a day. One could spend three days hiking directly to Ankavandra, but we drive to Tsiriamandidi and board a prop plane to Ankavandra. Country air travel here is itself an interesting experience, be it the orange cast of the windows or the actual color of the arid slopes, I feel like we're orbiting the red planet, Mars. In fact, we're over the Red Island, so nicknamed after 90% of Madagascar's rainforests were cleared, exposing and eroding iron oxide rich laterite soil. Use of wood by the Malagasy is largely about subsistence. Wood is chopped for building, for cooking, for heating, and of course, trees are cleared for slash and burn agriculture. Suffice it to say, Indri no longer inhabit every forested mountain ridge. In fact, they're highly endangered, and they're not alone. While Madagascar's rich biological diversity is gravely threatened, the Malagasy people themselves face an equally uncertain future. Just in the last 25 years, the population has doubled. Nowhere in our two-hour flight do we see a single paved road, or village, or sign of a living thing. Our destination, the Manambulu River, and there it is, winding below us. Shallow, slow-moving water and sandbars stretching out as far as the eye can see. And we thought the Tsurambinia was remote. 
the three days we spent motoring down 80 river miles was but a warm-up for the next five days, paddling 100 miles to the Bemaraha Plateau and passing through the Manambulu Gorge. Here, again, is why planning too tight an itinerary is a bad idea. The more remote the activity, the more questions raised about getting there. Of course, adventure travel is about the getting there. Clem, Pam, and Dawn throw a little work to porters. Some figure out the principle of a backpack, and some prefer the traditional mode, on the head. Maybe they know something we don't. In fact, the method does place the load directly over the body's center of gravity. The locals move efficiently. Meanwhile, my 60-pound bag pulls me rearward. We arrive at the river, but it's not our put-in point. Loaded with photo and video gear, our packs are not prepared to take a dunk. I hope for the best. Luckily, the river is only a few feet deep and spread wide. The flow manageable. This would not be the same during the wet season. In the heat of day, the water totally refreshes. A main objective of coming here is to finally meet up with the famous, or infamous, Nile crocodile. An average 100 Malagasy are killed each year by crocodile attacks, often while fording streams. I'm not encouraged by the low visibility in the water. I'm somewhat comforted by those plunging on ahead of me. Here's where adapting to going barefoot has its big advantage. Once your shoes are wet, sand and pebbles make the going unpleasant. At last, we arrive in a small village, our last resupply. Again, a big send-off party, mainly young children, bids us bon voyage. We were hoping to paddle our own craft, but that turns out to be Babari's jar. I'd welcome the exercise, but free of the paddle, it's also nice to take in our surroundings and film. The deafening engine noise aboard the African Queen, now a distant memory. A melodious flute, his companion, a lone wanderer, redefines the meaning of rich. With nightfall, a harvest moon rises. We awaken to a moonset on the far horizon. Minutes later, up comes the sun. The geology lining the riverbanks hints at a long history of sedimentation and erosion, followed by more sedimentation and erosion. This cone-shaped hill, clearly underlain by eroded sandstone, is covered by a thin layer of smooth river rocks. 
think of the flooding required to deposit the cobbles so high. Everything about this place says old. Our pirogues pull over to make landfall, and Barry wants to show us something. We ascend a 20-foot embankment. It's heavily eroded and obviously used to be much higher. These mini hoodoos provide a nice clue to the annual flooding here. Dawn arrives at the high point and takes in the area of interest. Already from my vantage point, I see it. A body of water. I know what this is. I remember seeing from the airplane when we flew in, and I even remember it showing on the map. A giant oxbow lake. Water entering what was once a sharp meander bend broke through a sediment bank and created a swift cut, abandoning the old flow route. High on the hilltop, we spot another tomb constructed of stone that doesn't appear immediately local. A loving bit of hauling by someone. Muswava and I have climbed a yet higher prominence to discover another surprise: a village containing some sizable dwellings, the largest presently under construction. Their ground is evidently not flood-prone. I wonder how many other villages like this we've passed, hidden behind the river's high embankments. Life on the Manambulu carries on at an unhurried pace. For Don and I, not used to being waited on, and both physically active, it's actually exhausting lounging around hour after hour, day after day. Gradually, we come to understand the meaning behind a Malagasy saying, "Mora, mora," or "Slowly, slowly." <laughs> <laughs> to change things up, Pam and Clem take the more stable yellow canoe. Don and I slip along in the dugout. With the foot. We cover mile after mile. The going ultra relaxed. The Manambula Gorge lies somewhere ahead. Umberi says it's around the next big bend. Tomorrow. Another timeless day on the Manambula River. I haven't even thought about it, but come to think of it. We haven't seen a single plane in the sky in two weeks. The only signs of man, man himself. Mainly children, wild-haired children, tended to by children. Josephi buys our supper. Out here, who knows how far from the nearest road? The river is the road, the marketplace, the provider, all in one. Whenever we pass others ferrying product upstream, the opportunity to say hello and make small talk is never passed up. <laughs> In the city, people avoid contact with strangers. But out here, where exchange of information is vital, contact with strangers is always invited. It's discouraging to see smoke on the horizon. Fires every day. 
every night. Fires everywhere. It's a true dilemma, a culture fond of cattle, rapidly denuding its environment. Sound familiar? We might be getting close to the gorge. A high rock wall rises from the water, gives way to another broad expanse. We head out over one of many giant sandbars. We'll meet the boats on the other side. It's a relief from all the sitting, a chance to move. The soft sand shows tracks everywhere, mainly human. We encounter this really huge, brightly colored grasshopper. Amberi says the Manambula Gorge is close, just up ahead. Of course, it's been close and just up ahead for already a day now. Mora mora. Our morning begins with an auspicious encounter. His black cape signifies he's the Sakalava holy man or shaman. Following local Fadi tradition, we make an offering of alcohol. If Amberi can figure out the twist top. Righty tidy, lefty loosey. The old village comes to him to ask her, ah, there is a, something happened here in this village because one or two persons are eaten by the crocodile. So he tells to the crocodiles, ah, sorry, we made a mistake and uh, we don't do the same thing on next time and he decides oh. that kill one zebu for having a benediction yeah that is the power of the crocodile yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the shaman assures amberi the spirit of the crocodile is aware of our presence we're fine to be here and he believes we will encounter him tonight mm -hmm. not far downstream we encounter spirits of a different nature a moonshine operation. It's a bit of a mystery to me how it works, but we're about to find out. Sugarcane chips soaked in water are left to ferment. After some pounding and poking, they're placed in bags and moved down to the still. Moonshining is illegal and accounts for a healthy business along the Manambulu. The chips are loaded into a big oil drum. A fire is readied. A large pipe is fitted through this tank-looking affair. A can provides a transition. I can't see how the mud and tangle of roots fit in. This is getting interesting here. Ah, he's sealing it. Heat from the fire cooks the alcohol from the chips. Water in the tank cools the pipe, causing spirits to condense along the interior. A white rum efficiently delivered at the open end. Not long in the river, and it's clear. We're finally entering the gorge. In this section of the Manambulu, a thousand foot high walls rise abruptly from both banks as the river cuts through the giant limestone massive that is the Bemaraha Plateau. This remote region of the country reportedly teams with lemurs, crocodiles, and other amazing wildlife. We also spot giant cave entrances up high, if only we had the time. 
So far, we haven't seen a single lemur on the Monobolo. We're surprised to see signs of burning this far into the gorge. The steep terrain couldn't possibly support grazing zebu. Evidently, another example of fire getting out of control, severely impacting the precious habitat. Our only find so far, a chameleon. We never tire of seeing chameleons. <laughs> Ironically, it's the thinned out trees that reveal a family of Deccan's safox. But as we get up for a closer look, we only see red-fronted brown lemurs. The safox have split. About the size of a house cat, the red-fronted brown lemurs move with ease on all fours through the treetops. They're also capable of leaping. Awesome leaping! Strictly arboreal, these guys take up in deciduous trees, feeding on leaves. But they can adapt to eating insects and other invertebrates, and even mushrooms when leaves aren't available. Unlike many prosimians, red-fronted brown lemurs don't show marked female dominance. The females are more reddish than the gray-brown males and a small baby is seen clinging to her belly. He's jumping, he's... Oh. Males have also been observed caring for young. We found a typical sized family of seven or eight. They keep to a fairly small range of only a couple acres or so. We're in a small patch of forest and we've only seen small patches of forest here in the Monambula Gorge. Tonight is the night, our last prime opportunity to locate and film the Nile crocodile. I'm told the leader of rum was quickly disappeared by our oarsmen. Perhaps they're gathering courage. Armed with powerful flashlights, we head into the dark under Nile crocs reportedly grow to be as long as 18 feet. I'm personally happy with half that length. From the time we shoved off the last sandbar, there'll be no place to make camp for the next five miles or so. We're committed. Our lights scan every which direction, always on the lookout for glowing eyes. There's a measure of safety, at least the feeling of it, sitting in the boats. I have no idea what this is about, but Babari sees something and climbs out of the boat. He's determined to find us a crocodile. I pray a crocodile doesn't find him first.
A small croc holds his nose just out of the water. But even a small croc can land a big bite. He slips away. We search and search, but no crocs. Wait, Clem has something. It's a man-eating gecko. So they, they have taken the skin. Perhaps here's why we didn't see but one small croc last night. They're all being hunted down. It's a depressing sight. The crocs are mainly valued for their skins. To the shaman, it's the teeth that hold meaning. You want this tooth pan? It's here. It's just a carcass, I tell myself. A wasted carcass. So let's not waste the teeth. I'd certainly never kill a crocodile for its teeth, but this is different, or so I tell myself. I should know better. Take nothing but pictures. Leave nothing but footprints. Kill nothing but time. It's the caver's motto, but it obviously doesn't only apply to caves. So long as folks glorify crocodile ornaments, there'll be a market motivating crocodile poachers until the crocodiles are no more. Complex thoughts and emotions tear at me. I'm disgusted by my own behavior. I'm disturbed by the environmental destructiveness here and everywhere. And yet, alienated though I feel from humankind itself, I also feel the connection. Salam. I'd heard it nearly all my life, how travel provides the best education. Our journey through wild Madagascar, often beautiful, sometimes not, runs parallel to a journey within as much an exploration of an exotic land as of the soul we only think we know. Nancy was right, of course we don't pay to see suffering, but that's the difference between vacation in paradise and adventure travel in the real world. As our pirogues float us down the final stretches beyond the gorge along the Manambola River, Pam, Clem, Don, and I reflect on the great adventure behind us and begin considering the one yet ahead. <laughs> 